Okay, excellent. So, Victoria, what are we talking about? We are talking about listening at C1 and C2. And in this webinar, we're going to be looking at abilities and tasks at C1 and C2. We are also going to try to give ideas to develop your students' skills. And finally, uh, we will also try to give, hopefully, practical ideas to use in class. We've taken a slightly different approach to each paper with the C1 and C2 webinars. We hope they've all been useful, but there are different things I think are maybe more useful to focus on depending on the skills that we're talking about. Um, we have speaking left on Friday. Um, so we'll see how we get on with that. But for now, we've said this at the beginning of our other C1 and C2 sessions. We think this is important. Um, all of these three areas are important at these higher levels. Um, I think in class um, activities and maybe for homework, but definitely, definitely activities that you um, you ask your, your students to do in class. I think integrating skills as far as possible is not only useful, I think each skill benefits from, from another, it's also um, it's the most natural way that we that we use language anyway. So um, we'll be looking at ways to approach the different listening tasks throughout this, but also with lead-in and follow-up activities and different ways to approach them, which integrate other skills as well. Also, Victoria? Yeah, um, skills integration allows for um, richer discussions and also and learning, as you said, is more natural and, and authentic, and we can use the material more effectively. And um, also, students at these levels uh, should hopefully have become more autonomous, and the teacher here is going to be more um, a guide, a facilitator, rather than um, like a, a teacher in uh, a helping a lot. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, sort of pouring your knowledge into your students yeah. um, and the more traditional view of teachers. Um, so again, as we have in the previous sessions, we'll have a quick look at the difference between C1 and C2. Um, C2, Victoria? Yes, um, they can basically do everything. They have no difficulty in understanding any kind of spoken language whether live or broadcast, and uh, which is delivered at fast native speed. Whoa, so good luck. <laughs> um, <laughs> anything you hear anywhere, at any time, in any place, mm -hmm. you should be able to understand. Um, C1 can understand enough to follow extended speech on abstract and complex topics between his or her own field, although she may, he or she may need to confirm occasional details, especially if the accent is unfamiliar. So there's always that still at C1, there's still a caveat. Um, moving on, recognizing a wide range of idiomatic expressions, colloquialisms, and appreciating shifts in register. And then lastly, Victoria? Yeah, they can follow extended speech, even when it is not clearly structured and when relationships are only implied and not signaled explicitly. Looking more specifically at the CFR descriptors for, um, for C2 and C1, uh, in work can handle complex, delicate or contentious issues, legal, financial matters. So again, looking at um, detail in context, looking at implications in context. Um, C1, Victoria? Yeah, they can follow discussion and argument with only occasional need for clarification, employing good compensation strategies to overcome in inadequacies. Oh, it's a tricky one. Was, was, oh, yeah. I was looking forward to that, but well done, well done. Um, C2 study can understand colloquial asides. Um, and cultural illusions, so maybe a little bit of cultural linguistics involved, probably not to a great degree within our exams, but um, things like accent and colloquialisms uh, will become more important and more difficult at this level. And C1 can follow up questions by probing for more detail, so developing and taking what they've listened to and then taking it a step further um, in their contributions. So in the chat box, what difficulties do students at higher levels have with listening? Ideas in the chat box, please. What difficulties do students have at higher levels? With listening. <laughs> I 
Thank you, Javier. Top of the morning to you. <laughs> um, intonation, speed, vocabulary, lexis, accents, yeah, pronunciation a lot of the time. Irony. Mm -hmm. we'll, be, we'll have a little look at something fun yeah. at the end in terms of irony and intonation and implication. Mm -hmm. Speed of the speaker. These tracks yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. Meta language. Whoa. Yeah, definitely. Speed, pronunciation. Lovely. I think we've covered most of what we came up with. Mm. Yeah. No, actually, nobody mentioned connected speech. Well, maybe they did. It was just going too quickly. Yeah. <laughs> that was brought up this morning. Connected speech can be a real problem. And, uh, you know, differentiating between words, because when we speak, we naturally do not speak like this. Um, mm. <laughs> accent as well. As I said, I mean, in our exams, we only use native accents, but a, a variety of native accents and at, um, well, m m more with more intensity at higher levels. Um, so making sure your students are, are familiar with a range of native accents, Scottish, Irish, Welsh, various English, um, North American, probably less of a problem. Um, with Netflix, uh, but Australia, New Zealand. Um, complexity, Victoria, mm -hmm. both of topic and yeah. language. Topic and language. So, um, well, we try not to, in our exams, we try not to um, require background knowledge from our um, candidates in order to be able to, to do the tasks. But uh, this becomes more and more challenging at higher levels, but also um, not complexity in terms of the of the language used as we've seen vocabulary and grammar structures become more challenging and yeah complex. and someone has just written scottish is horrible so i'm going to defend that um, <laughs> some 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 regional accents can be more difficult i would say that yeah. sort of edinburgh edinburgh scottish hmm. eastern scottish is one of the clearest accents native accents in english that exists i think especially for lower level learners but yes you can travel 45 minutes an hour across the country yeah. into glaswegian western that can be a lot more difficult um sorry sorry i thought it was a sweeping generalization saying that <laughs> scottish is horrible um higher levels also i think um employing a, a variety of different listening skills in the same task. So yes, we'll be listening for detail, sometimes very complicated detail, but also global versus local listening and listening for gist and doing all of these at the same time, especially if we're talking about um, attitudes, feelings um, over a much longer text, you've got to keep your working memory going for the overall impression of a text whilst being aware of um, of the more the more detailed aspects of what you're listening to um colloquial idiomatic expressions yes obviously the more natural the language becomes the more colloquial and idiomatic idiomatic it will become um have we spoken about intonation victoria was i not concentrating? I was going to ask you yeah <laughs> probably. have we spoken about that <laughs> um i don't think so no 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 i don't think so but yeah. it plays a very important role right intonation and also the effect it has on implication yeah, definitely. And I mean, in, in the speaking criteria for C1 and C2, especially, intonation does become more important. And being able to flexibly use intonation to change what, what you mean, um, regardless of what you are actually saying. And this will be, this will feature more in listening tasks um, at, at this level as well. Right. So moving on from that, what is challenging about, exactly, Paola, exactly, I agree, no accent is horrible. <laughs> what is challenging about working on listening in class? For you, what's challenging in a class situation about working on listening? Mixed mm, ability classes. Mm -hmm. Attention, yeah, depending on your tools, the resources you have available, organization. Attention span. Mm -hmm. Yeah, attention span, definitely. I think we spoke about this last week, or somebody said, what's the ideal length for a listening test? And so, well, it's not as, how long is a piece of string? But mm -hmm. in our exams, for example, 
Um, even proficiency is only 40 minutes, I think, with five minutes to transfer answers, something along those lines. Listening is very, it's, 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 it's hard work in another language. Um, it's quite stressful. I mean, an exam is even more stressful and it is very tiring. So you've got to choose your activities carefully and bear that in mind. I think David said this morning that research has shown there's a lot more brain activity going on when you're listening to a second language than a first language. So you've got to factor the attention and tire, the, the tiredness aspect into, into what you're doing in a test or in class. Mm. Um, we came up with, well, Victoria, limitations. Yeah, uh, limitations in terms of the material that can be used in class. Um, that they need to be um, appropriate uh, for the level, also in terms like for the school context, and also uh, whether you can use video or only audio. Um, if you want to use subtitles, if they are available, so all these. Um, factors need to be taken into account and sometimes can be um, can limit the number of, of resources. Yeah, and I think Charles just said, listening tends to be boring. <laughs> depends <laughs> what you're listening to. I, I will admit that our, our exams are, to some extent, boring by design, so candidates are not too distracted from the task at hand. But I think within class and outside an exam situation, you know, you should try and make try and make the content as interesting and as relevant um, as possible to, to to our students. Um, so trying to keep them engaged will, you know, obviously direct their focus and attention more towards the material they're dealing with, and hopefully improve their listening. Um, it's not. It's not the easiest thing to do, I know. And time. I mean, it takes it takes time to to set up a listening task, to listen to it once, listen to it again, have a, a, a lead out or a follow up task, perhaps. So you've got to factor all of these in. Mm. Um, are these challenges applicable to the online context? Well, yes, I think so, Victoria. What do you think? Uh, limitations, definitely. Yes, in terms of of limitations they, they can definitely be applied and um, although it is true that if students are using their own um, device they can maybe um, see the subtitles more easily if you choose to have them or um, they also have a screen for sure so a uh, video is also a possibility but uh, I think you were pointing out this morning George that maybe sometimes the platform that you're using needs to be taken into account because it well yeah happen. whether you can stream video whether you mm -hmm. send the links I mean limitations but also I think that the online context does give quite a lot of opportunities as well mm -hmm. and we should be focusing on those in terms of delivering electronic material etc and using a lot of resources online especially at these higher levels mm -hmm. um, I think there are a lot of opportunities depending on the um, depending on the level that you're that you're that you're working on mm -hmm. um, and somebody said subtitles and yes I definitely think there's a place for subtitles not in a, a, not, not in a listening exam <laughs> probably mm -hmm. not uh, but follow-up activities maybe even leading in to a very mm -hmm. complex text I think using subtitles likewise using tape scripts tape scripts are one of your greatest resources for following up on activities looking at how the activity was put together why their answers were right why the answers were wrong I and mean, I think we spoke about this in the reading and use of English mm. um, listening as well. I think afterwards, get them to come up with their answers, then maybe put them in put them in groups to decide on their answers. Ask them for their answers. If they get them wrong, don't tell them the right answer. Give them the tape script, or ask them to listen again and say put the responsibility in their hands to decide mm. why their answer was wrong. Get them to justify their answers as well. So different types of listening, <clears throat> um, all of them at this level, <laughs> definitely. Mm -hmm. But listening for the main points, so perhaps in a longer piece, um, it might be focusing on the general ideas a little bit more. It's very similar to sort of listening for gist, <clears throat> to catch a general idea or opinion of something. Mm -hmm. Victoria? Yeah, also um, they may uh, need to follow an argument in a longer recording as well. So they need to keep an eye on that. Also listen for detail 
And sometimes the information is not there explicitly. They need to infer um, it. So this also is another sub skill that they need to, to practice. And of course, they need to understand opinion and more abstract um, ideas such as feelings, for example, um, that um, come at higher levels. And also, as I said, as well, we'll look through the task types in the exams. Um, um, but in many of the of the of the parts of the C1 and C2 exam, we'll be testing a variety of these different types of listening. So it's not quite um, quite as, as as divided up as in the lower lower levels. Okay. Um, so luckily, the C1 and C2 papers have the exactly the same structure and same same task types in the four parts, which will make talking through them in this presentation easier. But part one, we have a multiple choice based on short texts. Mm -hmm. uh, part two, sentence completion, which we spoke about last time with the hippos. Mm -hmm. um, part three is a more traditional, a longer input text with a variety of multiple choice questions. And then the last one, the really horrible task is multiple matching which um, I'm not going to pretend it's easy. Uh, it's not. Our, our parts get gradually more difficult as they go through the exam. Mm -hmm. I think we've spoken about before. There's evidence um, that if an easier part follows a more difficult one, the candidate's performance on the easier one can be affected. So we try to make sure that in all of our, all of our exams, the tasks get gradually, gradually um, more, more difficult, more challenging. Mm -hmm. So let's talk through these and some ideas about how to replicate and use them in class. Multiple choice, part one, Victoria. Um, in terms of formats, there will be three extra extracts um, and students need to answer two multiple choice questions per extract. And they will be listening to dialogues uh, and monologues only in, in C2 proficiency. Lovely. So what are we testing here? Pretty much everything. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, we spoke last time, well, we spoke in the assessing and listening um, session last week about different task types and the values of different task types. Multiple choice, um, you can test a huge variety of things in a multiple choice. Uh, You've got to think, bear in mind when designing anything, specifically what you are, what you are focusing on. Um, but in this listing part one with the short extracts, we can be, uh, candidates need to understand attitude, opinion, the speaker's purpose, function, uh, mm -hmm. moving on, Victoria, in, in dialogues. Yeah, they need to identify whether speakers agree or disagree, also course of action, um, the gist, and also they will need to listen for detail. And as I said before, a variety of different voices, styles of delivery, and accents will feature in each listing paper. Because as we saw at C2, you should be able to understand everything you hear. <laughs> um, helping with this, helping with the part one in particular, Victoria? Hmm. Um, there is, um, at this level, there is a, a wide range of resources that we can use. Um, YouTube interviews, uh, BBC World Service, and um, also this in the interview archive available um, and on BBC website. Um, also, um, CNN, I think ABC was mentioned this morning for Australian accent. So there are a lot of options there, but you can also use classroom discussion activities um, to practice listening, as we will see later on. Yeah, and I mean, BBC World Service, you have a variety of accents on BBC World Service anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, BBC as well, you have a variety of regional accents. Um, the BBC is a wonderful resource, especially at these high levels. The interview archive, there's endless, endless material on there. I was talking this morning, there's a great show which has been running since the 60s, I think, or longer, called Desert Island Discs. Uh, which is interviews with celebrities, it lasts about 30, 40 minutes. Um, and they're just very friendly interviews. They have to choose, I think, five, maybe seven songs that they would take with them to a desert island. And in between little extracts from the songs, they talk about why they're important in their lives, blah, blah, blah. And it's a really nice, natural um, interview, um, interview format. And for 
for you know it makes it a bit more relevant to candidates um you know celebrities they're interested in if they like if they like um if, if they're fans of music as well um mm. and so many podcasts as well somebody this morning mentioned the Amer this american life it's one of my favorite podcasts it's fascinating big exposure to a variety of different american accents so um yeah listening to natural conversational english as much as possible i think Mm -hmm. will help with this part one. Um, here's a nice activity Victoria put together using Michael Caine, who has a very um, particular accent. Sir Michael Caine, apologies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, talk us through this, Victoria. Yeah, we are using the, the interview archive, and here uh, there was an interview with Michael Caine. So we're going to get students to... Um, we are going to introduce students to the topic, uh, asking uh, whether they know they they know who Michael Caine is, if they know uh, any films he has appeared in, um, and the good. As you can see, um, the, the interview is quite long, but it's like a kind of divided into different um, topics. So you can choose maybe the part that you consider more more suitable, maybe for your students. So once the this uh, warm-up part um, is finished. We are going to move on to the listening comprehension. And in this case, students will have to take notes of the questions and answers, and they, they can listen twice. And then, George, you want to go through the follow-up? Well, yeah, the follow-up is a lovely activity. So in pairs, get them to compare their notes on what they've listened to, try to reconstruct the conversation. So student A can be the interviewer, Student B can be Michael Caine. Um, and as David said, not a lot of people know that. Um, that's a catchphrase. Uh, <laughs> student A has to ask the same questions as the interviewer. The student B has to give similar answers, but to restructure them. Not exactly the same, so sort of paraphrase the answers, get the same general idea. And we're using so many different skills here. Um, listening, speaking, reading, um, in terms of comparing our notes, uh, use of English. Um, um, yes, David, um, and and writing. And student A then needs to identify the aspects that are not accurate. So a really nice activity that you could repeat with you know, a variety of different interviews. Okay. Um, part two, sentence yeah. completion, Victoria. What do learners have to do? Surprise, surprise. They need to complete the sentence with information <laughs> heard uh, on the recording. Lovely. Uh, so the listening focus tends to be in this part, more detailed stated opinions. Um, but at C1 and C2, you've got to be aware of B, I mean, even from B2 as well, the sentences that they have to complete will never be verbatim what they hear. Okay, so we're testing paraphrasing here as well. It does make it a little trickier for you to create as teachers. A little bit of thought has to go into it. The mm -hmm. hippo activity we were talking about, for those of you who weren't with us last week, was an example of something that some of our writers um, submitted. And we looked at the questions first. There were seven questions, sentence completion. And we asked all of the participants to try and complete the sentences before listening. And I think we got 80, 90% of the answers right mm -hmm. before we listen to the listening. So you've got to bear that in mind as well. The, the bits that you gap, the bits you have to complete cannot be easily guessable. Hmm. Okay. Um, sentence completion tips for students in sentence completion. Yeah, try to read the text um, carefully before before starting reading or at least uh, to get a general idea of what it it is about look at what comes before and after the gap and to try and predict uh, the type of word that could fit in of course listen <laughs> listen carefully and then uh, check that the answers make sense not only in terms of content but also in terms of grammar that the structure is correct exactly and we say this over and over and over in all closed activities all gap filled activities read it afterwards and make sure that it makes sense because sometimes especially if the distractors are good if it's a multiple choice close um or the distractors in the listening you might think oh that fits write it down they don't read it again and it's such a shame to lose um to lose lose marks like that um a couple of questions how would we do this online the michael kane 
activity. How would you approach that online, Victoria? I think we could do it quite easily, couldn't we? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think that maybe we can we can get students in breakout rooms, and that they when they are doing the interview, they are together, they are working together. Um, I think that could be main, probably the main problem. And then, um, if you are doing the listening, you can either uh, give the students the link. And they just can play the the recording and take their notes on her. And I mean, they could even they could set up a if they didn't have the platform for to record an interview per se, they could. Um, although I'm sure you could do that on WhatsApp. You know, it might be a bit tricky on WhatsApp. You could definitely use something like Flipgrid to go back and forth mm -hmm. and back and forth. And you know, lots lots of variety, lots of options you could. Um, well, lots of different paths you could take to to replicate that online. Um, so a really nice lead-in. Somebody said lead-in task for listening. Always, I think. I think we should always take advantage of leading up to a task, following up after, after a task. Victoria, what's this? You put this together for a sentence completion. Hmm. Um, some of our participants were talking about TED Talks and how useful the uh, resource it is. And here we are using it, but before... Um, uh, listening to the the talk, we are asking our students to again try to anticipate some of the content and some of the vocabulary that they are going to to hear. So uh, here they need to um, try to come up with a connection uh, between the three the three pictures. What so is the connection? Just, uh, <laughs> the, the, <Wow. laughs> the connection is that uh, well the presenter. Um, has gone on a trip to the South Pole, but he got his uh, his idea when he was um, on a trip in the in in the Sahara. So, ah, the Sahara, <laughs> not the Sahara. Yeah, the Sahara, not the Sahara Desert. The Sahara, yeah. which is the second biggest desert in the world, mm. because Antarctica is the biggest desert in the world. I think. Anyway, um, yes, you all mentioned TED, 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 TED. TED is an amazing resource for all of you. And there's so much interesting stuff on there. So you can really try and find stuff that that, that interests your students. And a lot of the TED Talks also have um, tape scripts with them, which makes mm -hmm. life easier to, for you if you're doing a gap fill. And again, um, following up. Um, Yes, in this case, uh, following up afterwards using tape scripts. In this case, we were using tape script for the main uh, listening comprehension activity. Uh, we use the, the script um, to we paraphrase the, the script um, so that students were not reading exactly what they were listening to, but then they had to, as in the exam, they had to fill in the, the gaps with exactly what they were hearing. Um, yes, and no, somebody said no, there's no lead in, in an exam, no, but as we're preparing them for the exam, I think using nice lead in tasks um, works very well. Okay, is there a follow up activity for this, Victoria? Oh, yes, okay. there is. Talk us through. <laughs> Yeah, um, the follow-up, um, students need to imagine that they could interview the presenter and uh, they need to think about questions that they would like to ask him. So in this case, they are going to work in pairs, they are going to compare their, their questions and do a role play. One of them is going to, to be the interviewer asking the questions and student B is going to be Ray and they have to Student B is going just to imagine what he would say. So based on the on the content of the video, probably. Exactly. And all of the things we've looked at so far, integrating skills. And um, as we said at the beginning, we think at this level, you know, there's no reason not to integrate skills um, as much as possible in class, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, do you want to answer Maria, Victoria, about leading lead in, lead in activities? Where is it? Uh, about, well, just about, you know, are, are they that useful because they don't have them in the exam? Mm, well, we are trying to, of course, they don't have it in the exam, but what, the idea is that they try to use this prediction and that it becomes automatic 
uh, to start uh, predicting or trying to anticipate what, what will come the day of the exam or in general. So if they have done this again and again in class, they have the resources and the technique to try to predict and anticipate the day of the exam. Exactly. At the end of uh, our session this morning, somebody asked, any exam tips? And the biggest exam tip I can give for listening is use the preparation time and be prepared to use the preparation mm -hmm. time effectively. Um, they do get preparation time. They need to really use that as well as possible. And doing this in class hopefully helps helps automate that or helps get them used to doing that and helps them predict, get ready to what they should be should be listening for okay thank you david there's david's much more official answer um <laughs> moving on to the part three <laughs> so uh, the longer multiple choice um he can see this is nearly always an it's always an interview isn't it well it's always a dialogue isn't it victoria oh no it can be two mm -hmm, or more speakers mm -hmm. sorry yes, sorry um it tends to have a discussion format oh, Okay, sorry, uh, yeah, no, uh, it tends to have a, a sort of discussion uh, within it. Very often a, a broadcast interview or what feels like a broadcast interview. And for a non-specialist audience, as um, we've said this before, we try and ensure as far as possible that none of our exam tasks rely on any background knowledge as far as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And it can feature two or more speakers. Um, three to four minutes long, multiple choice questions with four options, okay? And yes, they can be confusing, especially at this level, the incorrect answers, the distractors will be very tempting, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, so an approach to to practicing this in class, Victoria? Oh no, sorry, sorry. Focus on <laughs> the... <continue. laughs> sorry. Um, in part three, uh, we are testing candidates' ability to listen to longer interviews and discussions, so keeping a, um, or using their memory to bear in mind everything that has mentioned. Also show understanding of speakers' attitudes and opinion. And of course, uh, to some extent, identify agreement, gist, feeling, purpose, function, and details. So as George said at the beginning, basically everything. <laughs> uh, yeah, pretty much. Um... The kind of language we should be really be focusing on um, in terms of useful areas of language that will help them in this multiple choice task. Um, <clears throat> reporting verbs, obviously. So, you know, regrets, admits, resents, um, that express actions and opinions. Victoria? Are you with us, Victoria? Mm -hmm. Yeah, adjectives okay. and adverbs that describe adjectives. Yes, I'm here. Can you yeah, hear sorry. me? Sorry, no, you disappeared for a second. Yes, maybe it's my can connection. You hear me? I can hear you now. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, also, adjectives and adverbs that describe attitude and feelings. So, for example, disappointed, frustrated, and reasonable. And Any quite high high level well. we're talking about now. Um, so they're not going to be, you know, mm -hmm. we're not talking about happy, sad, irritated. Um, degrees mm -hmm. of certainty, you know, I was utterly convinced. I was a bit dubious. Mm -hmm. I was quite doubtful about that. So again, quite complex um, chunks um, that we that we use naturally to, to, to describe degrees of certainty. And Victoria's favorite? <laughs> These course markers uh, to, uh, um, that help us identify a, a change in topic, also agreement, disagreement, so moving on, I'm with you there. We will see some more examples later. Excellent. And some further teaching tips for this. Um, expose learners to longer interviews and discussions. There's plenty available on the BBC Interview Archive on YouTube. Um, when on the first listen, perhaps get students to identify the number of issues discussed, what these are, what these were. Um, ask them to try and identify what each speaker's general attitude is, where the breaks in the, in, in, in the interaction come. And lastly, Victoria. Yeah, encourage learners to concentrate on the question stems rather than the, the options so that they can listen for the answer in the text and then match these to the closest option. Yeah, especially in, in the first listening, I would encourage that, definitely. 
Mm -hmm. um, a very nice Leonardo DiCaprio focused um, <laughs> lesson plan for this, Victoria. <laughs> yes, we are trying to be motivating, George. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, here we are going to use the, the activity, which is uh, the, the topic is climate change, but it starts with a video of the Revenant. Okay, so a very short video and just get trying to get students interested and motivated. So asking whether they've seen it, if they would recommend it or not, what it is about, and if they can describe or tell their classmates about their favorite scene without spoilers. And uh, once they've done this, so it's a bit of skills integration, uh, watching the video and commenting on it. Um, sorry, Victoria, we're going sorry. To, sorry. Uh, we're going to give them uh, some pictures and some data. So in this case, a bit of reading. And again, uh, they need to look at pictures, so visual input. They need to comment on, on the data and the pictures and explain what they can see and what relation they think there may be between them. Between them. They are going to work in pairs and discuss their ideas. Lovely. Um, moving on. And just quickly, I disagree. I did like The Revenant. I don't think it was his best performance. So let's start a little argument in the chat box there. Uh, moving on, um, we're going to listen to Leonardo DiCaprio giving a speech to the United Nations. Um, and again, lead in activities to this. Can you tell me three pieces of info about Leonardo DiCaprio? Do you think he's a climate champion? Why and why not? Again, following up to ask them to justify their answers. And again, the prediction. What what ideas do you think he will mention before listening? Okay. Um, moving on, Victoria, when watching the interview, the next interview. Yeah, uh, with all the, the information from the videos and the, the data, they, um, they are going to watch the interview, but first they're just going to listen to the interviewer's questions, okay? And then they need to try and predict DiCaprio's answers using the, the previous information. Lovely. Then uh, uh, once they have uh, shared their idea, the activity with the whole video. Excellent. I, Glenn, Glenn, I agree, Glenn. I think that was a better performance. And um, so again, lots of stages, lots of scaffolding here breaking things down, breaking down the listening, focus on the questions, <laughs> think about the answers, um, predicting, predicting the answers before they then listen, um, before they then listen again to, to, to be sure of those answers. Um, and on to the dreaded part four. Um, so the multiple <laughs> matching, focus, again, pretty much everything here, uh, just attitude and opinion, main points, speaker purpose, speaker's feelings, um, to some extent trying to interpret the context. Um, and what makes it really tricky, I think, is the format, Victoria. Want to talk us through that? Yeah. They are going to listen to five short themed topic. They are about 30 seconds long each and they need to select the, the correct option from a list of eight. Which is quite challenging. And that's a list of, um, of eight, but two lists of eight. So we've got 16 options, only 10 answers. So we've got six distractors that we're playing with here. And there are two separate tasks. They listen to the recording twice, but they only hear it twice. And people were saying this morning, um, David was saying, you know, the first time he did it with students, they listened to it twice and I'm like, okay, where's the recording for task two? So I know. So this is probably this, the only task really where you only get one listening per task, um, so to speak, and to make sure they are aware mm. of, of the format of this and that they have, um, they have, they have sufficient practice before they tackle it. Um, it, it's it's a tricky it's a tricky um, task type. Um, tips for this: remind them, uh, remind your learners that the monologues are linked thematically. They're linked, um, and get them to think about the theme of the texts 
and the kinds of attitudes and opinions that they should expect to hear on that topic. And again, in part three, particularly, no, as in part three, but here particularly, a really strong sound knowledge of the types of words used to report attitudes and feelings in the questions will help the learners with this. Um, more tips, Victoria? Some more tips. Um, learners need to need practice in completing the answers when transferring their answers in the exam context because as there's um, quite a, a few boxes, it's easy to put the answers in the wrong box. Um, and then, of course, remind your students that in parts one to three, the order of information corresponds to the information and the questions on the page and the order of the information and the recording. But this is not always the case in, in part four. Yeah, they have to be aware of that. It's not always the same order. So cognitively, we're asking a lot of them in this task. They've got to really spend the preparation time to become familiar with what they should be listening for and keep an eye on, on, on all of the areas at once because they will not necessarily be in the same, um, be in the same order. Um, a really nice way to practice this, Victoria. Hmm. Uh, we are going to use uh, the material in the sample papers, but we are going to introduce it again with some visual input and asking students to relate to the topic. In this case, the topic is uh, taking a gap here, so we're going to ask them if they think it's a good idea, if they have ever considered the, this option, and what they think the main benefits are of this, of this activity. So once they are... Um, they have started uh, thinking about the topic and hopefully using some of the vocabulary that they are going to hear. And uh, we're going to move on to the next um, part. And can you can you hear me, George? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, well, I think I hope you can hear me because I can't hear anything. Um, I can so hear you now. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, so in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to use the, the script available in the sample papers. So students are going to uh, be reading the script for the different speakers at normal speed, while the rest of the class take notes. And then students work in pairs and compare their notes. They can listen again. And then as a whole group, they reflect on the key aspects of the message. In this case, uh, it's going to be what the speaker did during the gap year and the benefits they obtained. These are the two tasks in the, in the activity. And of course, they also need to uh, reflect on the language and how it is used to convey meaning. Excellent. And then, yes, repeat this. So you've got how many? You've got five different, five different scripts? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's a really nice way. And again, we're integrating skills as far as possible. I think practicing this in class with students is a good way to get them used to, to the format in a more scaffolded, structured way and getting them involved in it. Um, <clears throat> so dicta glosses, I think, are wonderful, wonderful ways to deal with listening and to make it more of a, more of an, well, integrate skills more in class. Dicta glosses, running dictations, which are great from little ones all the way up to, to, uh, to, to students at higher levels, um, are all lovely techniques. Um, once you've read all of the scripts, the teachers can then show the students the task. So don't even show them the task before you start this. Show them the task afterwards, then ask the students to choose the best option for each of the speakers. Um, and then they should justify their answer, underlining in their notes where they found the answer, and then comment on potential distractors. A follow-up to this will be looking at the looking at the <clears throat> tape script in its whole well, in its entirety. Um, mm -hmm. Give everybody all of the scripts and then again go through, have a look at the tape script, underline where the answers were and underline where 
where the distractors came up. Mm -hmm. Anything else for multiple matching, Victoria, apart from good luck? Yeah, I think that's it. That's it. The most important yeah. part of it, yeah. I think so. Um, and so lastly, a little bit on live listening. A lot of the things we've been looking at are watching videos, etc. Yes, but integrating skills as far as possible within activities and building listening into our speaking activities. Uh, the values of, of live listening, Victoria, in class? Mm -hmm. It gives learners a, a purpose to speak, in this case for fluency, and also to listen. Also, it creates a context for the activity, generating and eliciting language and also activating schemata, which is going to help them in the listening comprehension. And then also students, um, I think uh, they, they can relate more to the, to the topic, to the activity, they have a more active role. And also it provides quick and easy listening practice. Excellent. Um, okay, so we've made it through the four parts, offered some advice, hopefully, for you know how to deal with these effectively in class and how to break them down. We've said this in lots of other, other sessions, but I think it's useful when preparing students for tasks to not just sort of, you know, put them in front of what they will be facing at the end. Um, sort of with no support, but breaking things down into as many stages as possible and supporting them through their stages, building up to the task itself um, is, is always useful and of value. Um, so we've, been, we've mentioned a few times, one, one aspect at C1 and C2 is implied meaning. Um, and we're going to have a little bit of fun to finish mm -hmm. off. Uh, this kind of material would not feature in a C1 or a C2 um, exam. But this was has been going around on the internet for a while. There's a link at the top of the screen. But um, we find this very entertaining, and hopefully you'll have a giggle as well. And it's a list of common expressions you'd probably find more in a professional or, a, or, a, or an educational um, context. Um, and this is very, this is very sort of um, culturally bound. Um, but examples of things that British people say, what is often understood, um, and what British people sometimes mean by what they say. I'm sure you're aware of, um, you know, but our our appreciation for and perhaps sometimes overuse of irony, etc. Um, mm -hmm. But this is quite entertaining. You can find this online and go through it with your students, your higher level students. I'll just give you access to the certificate now. Um, so, Victoria, George, I think I, you start. Yes, I'm going start to start. <laughs> I hear what you say, George. Oh, so, oh, so what I understand that is, oh, she accepts my point of view. What, what, what do you really mean, Victoria? I disagree, but I do not want to discuss this any further. Any further. Hmm. <laughs> okay, well, that was that. I thought that was quite a good session, Victoria. Hmm. Um, I understood that, that it was a, quite a good session. Uh, what I really mean is, no, that was quite disappointing. Um, whose is the next one, Victoria? Is it yours or is it mine? I think it's... Oh, um, it's me. And uh, with the greatest respect, Victoria, starting a conversation with, with the greatest respect, Victoria uh, would probably understand... Yes, George is listening to me. But what I really mean is, I think you're an idiot. <laughs> um, <laughs> Beginning, beginning a work conversation, or maybe finishing one with, oh, by the way, oh, incidentally, um, you probably understand, oh, this isn't very important. What we tend to mean by that is, Victoria? The primary purpose of our discussion is... <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, moving on. Hmm, thanks for that input, Victoria. Uh, could, we, could we maybe consider some other options? Oh, George hasn't decided yet what he's no, going to talk about. But what I actually mean is under no circumstances are we going with your idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, I gave Victoria a bit of work last week and she came back and said... Um, yeah, I only have a few minor comments, George. Which, which you know, you might understand but as uh, she's found a few typos, perhaps. But what you really mean, Victoria? Please, George, rewrite it completely. <laughs> um, Victoria had an idea for a webinar last week, 
Uh, so I said, oh, that's a very brave proposal, Victoria. <laughs> And I thought, well, your things I have courage. What I really meant was, you are completely insane. No way <laughs> will we be going with that. And the most famous one, perhaps, in English is, hmm, very interesting, Victoria. <laughs> Oh, so George is clearly impressed. But normally when we say very interesting, we mean, no, that's complete nonsense. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, so, yes, we don't we don't condone that. And this is, you know, a little bit of um, cultural, cultural linguistic fun uh, with perhaps, you know, British, British um, uh, <clears throat> comments, comments, etc. in mind. OK. So to finish off, um, further resources that you can find? Yeah, um, if you uh, visit our website, you, you will find the section supporting every teacher. And there, apart from exam preparation material, um, also the blog supporting every teacher and also access to our free webinars, you will also be able to find free teaching material. And uh, these material includes lesson plans that go from um, pre-A1 starters up to C1 advanced. And um, our colleagues from UK have been um, um, creating a lot of lesson plans uh, that can be adapted to the face-to-face -face or the online situation. So whether you are working in one or the other context, you can still use them. Excellent. Um, our support guide for teachers, if you haven't found this already, um, you can find it on that link there. It's also on the document of um, useful links that we gave you, that we gave you access to. Um, <clears throat> and it basically, it has everything in one place. Nice interactive PDF with access to all of our resources. Um, and lastly, I think, yes. Supporting every teacher, um, our colleagues at Cambridge University Press, their World of Better Learning website, and our Teaching English Online MOOC um, has come back online a week or so ago, I think. Got amazing feedback from that um, the first time around. We stole some ideas from that as well to use for our webinars. <laughs> so it's well worth it. It's um, a very useful, informative talk. Um, and yes, I think Anna said somewhere, that in international projects and meetings, the native speakers are nearly always the greatest source of misunderstanding. And I completely agree. We do know, you know, that English, you know, is the sort of lingua franca for international business for now, at least. And I have heard that many times that the native speakers are often the problem. And everybody understands each other at the meetings except the native speakers. Um, so <laughs> bear that in mind. Um, so, any any more questions for the last last couple of minutes <clears throat> before we finish? All of the links that we showed are available in the useful links document, okay? Uh, which I gave you access to. I'll give you access again. Stop sharing, share, and to the certificate. Um, any problems with certificates, please email us. We do have a little bit of a backlog of emails which we're trying to get through. We will over the next week or so, week or two. Um, and also all of our webinars go up on YouTube and you can download the slides and handouts once they're up there on YouTube. So this one will probably be up end of this week, beginning of next week. Um, and on Friday, we will be doing the last in our C1 and C2 series, which will be looking at speaking at C1 and C2. Mm -hmm. So we hope to see lots of you there on Friday. Um, if you haven't signed mm -hmm. up already, go to, a, go to the global website, just Google Cambridge English webinars and you should be able to sign up for that session there. Same time as today, so 11 o'clock and half past five, Spain time. Thank you all very much. Any any last questions? Thank you very much. The certificate you should be able to download now from the files area in the bottom right hand corner. Should be able to download your certificate. That's an editable PDF.
Okay, well, thank you all very much for coming along once again, and we hope to see you on Friday. Um, have a uh, lovely Wednesday evening and a successful Thursday, and we'll see you on Friday. Okay? Bye. Thank see you, you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.